chapter number six, Matthew chapter number six, been going through a series on Wednesday nights on the model prayer and we've got more of them than will fit in the four Wednesday nights and so I'm going to do, going to not do all of them ultimately, but I am going to do one tonight and then one this coming Wednesday and, and probably then uh, Sunday night coming. And so I want to make sure we uh, just uh, try to stay within the time frame. So we've covered in, the, in this model prayer uh, that is recorded for us in Matthew chapter 6, we've covered that prayer is about resting in the Lord. And what a tremendous opportunity we have because if you're saved, you've got God as your Father. Amen? And there's a lot of comfort in the fact uh, that we can rest in Him. And then we talked about prayers about resigning. Resigning from our plans that we might serve Him. Uh, not my will, thine be done. Uh, to pray for God's will to be done in heaven uh, in earth as it is in heaven, uh, is to resign from our ambition in order that we might seek his, uh, the preaching of the word of God and the souls that need to be saved. Then uh, this past Wednesday, I uh, was able to preach on the subject of prayers about requesting. And we focused on the phrase, give us this day our daily bread. Tonight, we want to... Uh, go down to verse number 12. The Bible says in verse number 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Father, I pray that you would help us tonight to uh, glean from this something that will be helpful in our prayer life that we might uh, understand the importance of keeping clean accounts Lord, uh, that we might be ready and willing uh, to forgive and to desire to be forgiven. God, in all of these things, we might uh, find that how, how this impacts uh, our life of prayer. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As I mentioned this morning, there are many things that will hinder uh, effective prayer. There are two sides, as I mentioned this morning. There's one. Uh, where we need to learn to pray. I mean, just we need to make time to pray. It's not that we sometimes don't pray effectively. It's sometimes we just don't pray. And a lot of prayerlessness in Christians and, and uh, talked about why that is wrong. It is sinful uh, not to pray. Uh, and so uh, to uh, along that line, as I talked about this morning, things that will not just keep us from praying, but also things that will keep our prayers from being effective. And so we need to, to add to this that we need to have a, a heart of repentance and forgiveness. And so we want to talk about prayer is about repenting. Why is repenting important? It's important to our prayer life. It's important to our life uh, uh, in our walk with God, our closeness in fellowship, our walk with one another. Uh, if, we, if we are not uh, careful, we let barriers get uh, built up and that keep us from serving the Lord as we should. And when those relationships are not, are not kept uh, sweet and, and kind and, and, uh, and forgiving, uh, then we find, as I said this morning, it hinders our prayer life. And so prayer is about repenting. In this passage of Scripture, he teaches us to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So this prayer that we are to pray involves confession. It involves a confession that we are not we have not yet uh, been made perfect in the sense of we never sin. We never do anything wrong. We try, and as we grow in the Lord, we hopefully, though we are not sinless, hopefully we sin less. 
And uh, we catch ourselves, you know. Uh, even you say, well, no, I, I haven't sinned in a long time. And we're thinking about, you know, things like, you know, uh, drunkenness or immorality and things like that. Uh, but the Bible even says that we sin when we fail to pray for one another. And certainly we have often failed to pray for one another as we should. The Bible also talks about our attitude one toward another. We talked about it this morning in Acts 24, 16, a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men, uh, that we can have a clean conscience. And, and, uh, and very often we, are, we find ourselves guilty of uh, when somebody gets brought up, they're not our favorite person, and our initial thought about them is not Christ-like. You say, well, that's not a sin. Well, it's, it's, it's not a virtue, uh, so I'm not sure what you want to classify it as. But what does the Bible say we ought to think about them? Love, what? Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And so when we love them as we should, it modifies our attitude about them. And eventually, sometimes we come to that and we say, oh, I shouldn't have thought so ill of them. Uh, and, uh, and I'm going to pray, okay, but it takes us time to get there. As we walk with the Lord, hopefully that time gets shorter and shorter to where our first response will be as it ought to be. But when we pray, we, need to, we are also confessing before the Lord when we say something like, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We are admitting and confessing that we don't always think and do the right things. It is very often one of the hardest things to do is to control the tongue. The Bible says the man that can control his tongue, the same is a perfect man. And so it's a truth that uh, many times Christians have trouble with is that we may be saved, but we still do sin. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10 says this, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But praise the Lord for the next verse, if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But the next verse on the other side of that, the two verses that sandwich our favorite verse from the passage, Verse 9, the two verses on either side. Verse 10 then says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. You know what that means? That means every one of us needs to be forgiven on a regular basis. Wasn't that the clear testimony of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter number 7? We won't take time to read it, but you might be familiar with it. Verses 14 through 25 and in those verses, you find the Apostle Paul saying, the things I know I should do, I don't do. The things I know I shouldn't do, that's what I do. And he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then he says, I thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. He is the remedy uh, for our sin. Um, so, but some, Christ, some people, they never confess their wrongdoings. I've had people look me straight in the face that I've had to rebuke them about their things that they had just done, things that they had just said, things that I had, that it wasn't I heard about it, I witnessed it, I saw it, and I confronted them about it, and they looked me straight in the face and say, I'm not willing to admit I did anything wrong. And I'm like, well, it's obvious to everybody that you did wrong. Well, I'm not willing to admit it. Okay, well, it doesn't change the fact if you're not willing to admit it. Just because you don't want to say that you've done wrong doesn't change the fact of what you've done wrong. And the truth is, what I think about it doesn't even matter. What matters is what God thinks about it. Because we will all stand before the Lord, either at the judgment seat of Christ as a saved person, or at the great white throne of judgment as a lost person, but we will all answer to God. Some people, they never go to anybody else and say, you know what, I'm sorry. I, I said something I shouldn't have said. I inadvertently hurt your feelings. I, I, uh, I feel bad about 
about uh, the way that came out or the way that came across, and, and I want to, I want to, I want to uh, ask you to forgive me for that. Uh, we, we need to try to be uh, open about, uh, and I'm not talking about making public announcements, but, but not shy about the fact if we've, even if we've made an error, you know, when I do the Bible study down at Gordon, I try to, try to, to tell those guys, because you have to understand that they've been, they've been exposed to every kind of thing that you just, you just wouldn't believe. And I'm talking about from a religion standpoint, as inmates, it's been a, a lot of everything thrown at them. And so I, I try to let them know that, look, I won't always be right, but if I, I, if I find out I'm not right, I'll tell you about it. Recently, I uh, was, um, we were talking about baptism, and, and the term, one of the inmates brought up the term Anabaptist. He had heard of Anabaptists. And and uh, and I and I made this statement. I said, "Yeah, the the um, the prefix Anna A N A. I said uh, it means against, and they were accused of being against baptism. And uh, and I looked that up later because I, I was just like, as as I said it, I was like, boy, I'm not. I, I think that's not exactly right. And so I looked it up later. I couldn't look it up then because can't have any electronic devices in there. So I looked it up later, and 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 it doesn't mean against. It means again." And so it's rebaptizing, which they were accused of being against baptism. And so that kind of stuck in my head. But you know what I did? I went back the next week and I said, men, I said, what I said to you was not right, was not accurate. The word means again, baptizing. So, uh, and so I went back and I corrected it. Why did I do that? Because I want to be credible. I want to, I want to be uh, believable, and all I'd done is make, I didn't, didn't, didn't sinned, but I just said something that wasn't correct. I made an error, and I tried my best to correct it. And I, and I told him, I said, look, if I find out something I tell you is wrong, I will come back and make it right. I'll, I'll, I'll correct myself, I said, but, uh, but I'm not going to be shy about preaching and teaching what I believe the Bible says. And so we need to be mindful of that. Too many conduct themselves as if they have never done and could never do anything wrong. But every saved, truly saved individual should have the right view of themselves, which is that we are but sinners saved by grace. And we ought to have a constantly growing uh, anger towards sin that invades our life, that pushes its way into our mind, that keeps uh, bearing down upon us, the sin that does so easily beset us, and we ought to be growing in our hatred for it because of what it does to our life. We, the sinful man, tends to love his sin and hide, hide it uh, to uh, try to keep it from being discovered. But when somebody wants to be right with God, they learn to hate their sin because of what their sin is doing to them, their family, their opportunities, their life in general, and certainly their relationship with God. So that the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 7, O oh, wretched man that I am. You know, a clear view of our sin will help us to see ourselves as God sees us, that we are but sinful men. But if our prayers are going to be heard, if our prayers are going to be effective, there needs to be a clear, conscious, uh, a clear conscience concerning our sin. It's not something that has happened to us. It's something that's happening in us. It's something that we are doing. And as a result... We, in effect, cause our prayers not to be answered. We offend a brother and we don't go to them and apologize and seek forgiveness from them. Most people look at their sins and failures and seem to never want to deal with them for, before God, certainly not before men. You know, the, the thing is, God already knows. And it's likely that men also know. One thing is for sure. Every one of us will battle sin or sinful attitudes until we meet the Lord. 
Now, <clears throat> you say, oh, that means we'll never get victory in the area. I didn't say that. We can often get victory in certain areas. We just simply won't get victory in every area until we see the Lord. You say, well, how does that work? Let me quickly try to mention this and then we'll move on. It is, it's likely that when we first got saved, the sins we were dealing with, trying to get victory over, were big sins. I mean, they were, they were obvious sins. Uh, the very first verse that I memorized as a saved uh, man at 21 years of age was 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Someone, I, I was just talking to someone about it the other day, and, and, I, and I brought it up, and, uh, and they said, why that verse? And I said, well, it's very simple. Because I recognized when I first got saved that there was a real problem with temptation. And I said, I wanted victory over it. And so many, many times a day, that verse was on a three by five card that I had written it out. And I would read that verse many, many, many times a day. I'm going to simply guess, just for sake of illustration, easily 30 to 40 times a day. Because, and, and most of you know the story about where I put those and what you know, triggers I used. But easily 30 to 40 times a day, uh, I would quote or read and then end up quoting 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. And this man said, why that verse? Because I wanted victory over temptation. I wanted God's help. And I said, you find a verse that speaks to your heart that brings the help to your life that you need. And you make it a matter of memorizing it, hiding in your heart. Why? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Uh, so you hide it in your heart to keep it. So we dealt with those big sins. And we get those behind us and we move forward. And, and there's another classification that we think of maybe a little smaller sins, but still sins. And the farther we go in our Christian life, it might seem as though the sins get less radical, less uh, magnified, less important. But they are no less important because they still hinder our walk with God. And so the Bible here says, forgive us our debts. <clears throat> there are five uh, basic words in the New Testament that refer to our sin. The first is probably the most common. There are three variations of it, but it's the word uh, hamartino. And I just mentioned that because the doctrine of sin is called homardiology. It comes from that Greek word, hamartio, uh, uh, that uh, refers to sin. It, the word means to miss the mark. You're aiming at something and you have missed the mark. For all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. They have missed the mark. Then the next word. It's not important that you know these words. I, I don't suppose. But the second word is often translated offenses or trespasses. It has the idea of slipping or falling. Falling into sin. We often talk about it. And... Uh, it refers to sins that result from a careless, uh, uh, a careless attitude, not intentional, but 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 because we have left our, ourselves unguarded, because we have not put in in proper boundaries in our life, we have allowed for things in our life, and we find ourselves falling into sin. Then the third word is usually translated as transgression. It means the intentional crossing of a boundary. It, is, um, it, is, it literally means without the law or against the law, lawlessness. Uh, it is the idea of you've got the command of God, but you say, I don't care what God says. I don't care what his word says. I'm going to do what I want to do. That is transgression. Uh, the sin of Adam and Eve was a transgression 
of God's law. They knew the law of God. There was no mistake about it. It was clearly stated and put forth, and they simply believed Satan's temptation that God's just trying to keep you from something good. And so they willfully chose to sin. The fifth is the word uh, found here that's translated debt. And uh, it, it just means what it, it, what it says. It is something, it is the result of sin that we owe something. That because of our sin, we are in debt. Um, Romans chapter number four, verse four says this. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. It's uh, Romans chapter four is saying, if you are, are thinking that you're going to somehow earn your salvation, you're going to work for your salvation, you're somehow going to uh, deserve it, then what is reckoned to you is not grace. What's reckoned to you is the debt. If you want to pay the debt, Here's the debt. What is the debt? It is eternity being under the judgment of God. You say, well, is there any way out of that? Yeah, the grace of God. The grace of God brings salvation. Amen? Um, and so, uh, but if you want to work for it, it is the debt. It is the debt that we owe because of sin. And so when the Bible says, forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. When you wrong someone, you owe them something. You owe them uh, to come and, and get clean with them. You, come, you owe them uh, an apology. You owe them, uh, uh, you owe, owe them the opportunity to have things corrected and made right. And so when the Lord calls, uh, calls our sin a debt, he's reminding us that when we sin, we owe something because of it. In other words, it's not going to go away just because you go, oh, well, I guess I shouldn't have done that. Oh, well. No, there's still a debt to be paid. And so what is, what is he referring to here? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You know, we need to understand that when the Lord redeemed us, it is true that positionally we are saved God owns us. Uh, he, has, um, he has forgiven our sins. Uh, but it's also true that because of that, we owe him a debt. That's what the Bible means in Romans chapter 12 when it says that we are to surrender or submit our bodies to him as a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. It is reasonable that we serve the one who saved us from an eternity in the lake of fire. So let's just uh, uh, wrap this part up by saying, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I'm confessing to the Lord that I have a problem in my life and I'm aware of the fact that it puts me in debt uh, and it must be corrected. It needs to, if I want God to forgive me, I also need to be ready and willing to forgive someone else. If we are bought with a price. Our life is bought with a price. And so we are to glorify God in our body and our spirit, which are God. So, so this prayer involves a confession. Number two, it involves a cry. If my greatest problem in my life has been sin, my greatest need is for forgiveness. So when we raise the issue of forgiveness, somebody's going to say, well, I'm saved. Aren't all my sins already forgiven? Well, yeah, the penalty of your sin is forgiven. But there is still the sin that we commit day by day. It is the lesson Jesus taught when he said, when, you, when he was washing the disciples' feet, and, and Peter said, you're not going to wash my feet. He said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. He said, well, then wash me all over. He said, you don't need to be washed all over, just your feet. Why? Because the illustration is that as you walk through life, it is your feet that get dirty. In other words, as we walk through this life, we get a little bit of the world on us, and we need a little bit of 
cleansing. We need a little forgiveness. We need God to be able to, to make us clean again. And so uh, it is our iniquity, the Bible says, that separates between us and God. But practically speaking, we do that on a daily basis. We have a permanent relationship with God in that he has become our heavenly father, but we grieve him when we sin. So what do we do? We need to come to him and say, God, my heavenly father, forgive me for that. And he's ready and willing to do that. But there's also not only a, 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 a cry, not only a confession, but there's also a condition here. And the condition is that uh, we are willing and ready to forgive others their debts. In other words, when someone has wronged us and they want to make it right, we need to be ready and willing to do that. We need to be uh, mind. uh, You're not going to say, well, forget it. I I won't ever forgive you for that. And then think you're going to get forgiveness for God. Why why is that true? Why why does the Bible say uh, if we forget? Notice verse number 15. And 16, we read verse 12, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Notice verse 14, excuse me, verse 14. For if you forgive uh, men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Why is that? Is God holding it over our head? No, I believe this is the case. I believe that if someone will not be, have a forgiving spirit towards someone else, they do not understand repentance and forgiveness. In other words, getting forgiveness from God is not just name it, claim it. God sees your heart. There are denominations that try to teach you, you can live any way you want to on Friday as long as you, as you confess it to, to someone on Saturday. As long as you go in and and get into the booth and and tell, oh, confess, well, say so many hell berries and you're good. That you can say and do whatever you want to do and just confess it and it's okay. Hey, God knows our heart. God does not forgive sins in that way. When we confess our sin to God, it must be because we understand the guilt of our sin. And so we come to God and we say, forgive us our debts, and he will, but we must be ready to forgive those who are indebted to us. The Bible is very clear that when we have been wronged, offended, or hurt, we need to bring that to the Lord and give it to him. But uh, the Bible also says that if if your brother comes to you, if he's offended you, and he comes to you and he repents, you are to forgive him. And then in Luke 17, it says this, if, thy brother, if he shall trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day again return to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostles answered and said, Lord, increase our faith. We're going to need more faith to do this. More, more of a tenderness, more of, a, of an understanding of what forgiveness is. And so if we will not forgive others, remember the, the parable that Jesus gave about the man that was forgiven a great debt uh, because he said, uh, you know, have patience with me, have mercy on me, and I'll repay thee all. And he forgave the debt, but then his fellow servant that owed him just a fraction of what he had owed came to him and said, hey, have mercy on me. Be patient with me, and I'll repay the... And he would not. He would not, and he had him thrown in a debtor prison. And the illustration is this. If we will not forgive those that have wronged us, we cannot suppose that God will forgive us. Charity suffers long and is kind. We are to put on as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, Kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. Even, excuse me, the Bible says there in Colossians 3, if a man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And so there is a condition. Someone said this. They said, 
person is never more like Jesus than when we are forgiving those who have wronged us. Never more like Jesus than when we forgive those who have wronged us. Forgiving and being forgiven are so important to the Christian life and to effective prayer that if we are unwilling to forgive someone who's wronged us, we cannot expect that God will forgive us. And why? Because we do not understand the basics of forgiveness. That repentance means that we feel bad about what we've done. That repentance, and repentance is not just, okay, yeah, yeah, I guess I did wrong. Hey, let's, let's move on. We've had people try to, you know, they're going to make things right. And their attempt at making things right was, well, everybody sometimes says something they're not, not proud of, so we're good now, right? That's, that's, that's not repentance. That's not uh, that's not a heart of repentance. And somebody that doesn't understand repentance any better than that should not expect that God's going to give them repentance. Why? Because they're being casual and careless in their life. There's a condition, and that is that we make sure that we have a repentant, excuse me, a forgiving attitude one toward another. And we're going to wrap this up early tonight. I just want to say, hey, prayer, prayer is about resting in our relationship with, with God. It's about resigning from our desires that we might do what he wants us to do. It's about requesting and letting our requests be made known unto God, but it's also about repenting. It's about repenting so that we keep a clean conscience toward God. Father, I pray that you would help us as we keep thinking about this model prayer. Lord, you taught this in response to the desire of your disciples to learn how to pray. And you said, pray after this manner, pray ye. And in the midst of that prayer, you said, forgive us, pray. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. God, I pray that we would see the importance of being right with one another so that we might be right with you. With our heads still bowed and our eyes still closed as we stand to our feet and the piano begins to play.